Good morning, church. Yes, so I'm going to be reading from Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 to 10. If you have your Bibles or your mobile phones. <laughs> so, Colossians chapter 2. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than of Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Thanks so much, Bernie. Well, church, uh, great to see you today and uh, to be with you to worship Jesus together. How's everyone going? Good. I hope the rest of you are going okay too. <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, we come to your word now. We just um, open our hearts to you. We open our hearts to your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would speak to us and move among us. And we thank you that you've already been moving among us in our time of worship and prayer and communion. So we just open our hearts. We say, Lord, yeah, deposit in our hearts what is on your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, um, God is so good, church. You know, he's been moving in such amazing ways like the way in which the Vertical Villages is moving forward with the Together for Ride movement. Corey's been a significant part of that. God is opening doors for the gospel to move in significant ways. And, you know, some of you may know School for Seniors that Wesley Mission runs in the city. Uh, the, the head of School for Seniors now, uh, who, who we know well, just said to us, hey, would you guys ever be interested in running an Alpha course for our seniors? I mean, come on, how cool is that, right? You know, so we're like, yes. So we've locked that in for term three. You know, Gene, myself, and whoever is, wants to volunteer, we're going to be setting up an alpha course to bring those seniors to Jesus. You know, and how good is that? And the lady, Elizabeth, she said, you know, they're seniors, you know, not long left. So, you know, we share the gospel with them. So, uh, yeah, that's one way to put it. But, uh, but praise God for that opportunity to be able to share the gospel with them. And uh, some of you may know that a bunch of our guys did some outreach in Mortdale down south during Easter because uh, some of the churches there said, hey, we've got all these buildings, we want to plant a church. So we did an Easter outreach. Sam, Bert, Angus, uh, and Sarah, a whole bunch of others, they went there and they just surveyed people offering Easter eggs for free. And they surveyed 50 people. Ten of them said, hey, look, if you ever do something around here, we'll come. I mean, come on, that's amazing. That's 20% of people that they have no idea who they are just said, yeah, let us know if you're going to plant something here. That's amazing. And one of them came up to Sam and said, Sam? I said, yes. <laughs> Sam, it's me. It was someone that he knew from primary school. And that was in a couple years a bit older. And so he didn't even recognize the guy. And the guy said, yeah, you know, I've tried church, but, you know, but if you do something here, I'll come. How good is God? And, and so we just, God's on the move. And so how is he calling us to sow into that and to invest into that? Kev, is that you? Kev and Matthew? Okay, great to have you back uh, joining us here. Uh, yeah, Kev, you know, was here as a student from overseas, part of the Young Adults Ministry, one of our leaders, and they're just back here for a little bit. So we welcome you guys uh, back for this time. Anyway, sorry, I got distracted. Um, but how is God calling us to take steps of faith? And, you know, I do want to encourage you as, as well as what Corey was sharing before, that our pledging enables us to do these things. You know, it enables us to step out in mission and evangelism and discipleship. Uh, and another story I just want to share really briefly is, uh, you know, JT's ministry in Thailand, they were doing outreach to the local villages, knocking on doors just to see how people are going. And they knocked on the door of one man, and he was lame. He couldn't walk properly. So they, shared the, they, they prayed for him. He got healed on the spot, right? 
they share the gospel with him. He gave his life to Jesus right there and then. And ever since then, yeah, let's give God a clap of praise for that, right? Come on. Ever since then, he's been at church, rain, hail, or shine. He's there. And he just, he just uh, got baptized last Sunday. How cool is that? Right? How good is God? So again, God is on the move. Let's keep sowing into that in our prayer, you know, in our generosity, in our service, in our volunteering, in our support. Oh, that's not even the sermon. Sorry, guys. Just exciting to see God moving. All right. At the heart of a vibrant faith, an alive faith, authentic relationship. That's at the very center of it. Authentic relationship with Jesus and authentic relationships with one another. Authentic relationships with the people that we're trying to reach for the sake of the gospel. You know, there's no secret sauce. There's no special 11 secret herbs and spices of spirituality when it comes to growing in faith. But Jesus, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He's at the center of our faith. He's, he's the, the, the very core of what it means to be alive and to keep growing in our faith. Jesus is all we need. But it's so easy to be distracted from this reality. I don't know if you've ever heard about the one degree difference. You know, uh, if you're flying from Los Angeles to Rome, Italy, in a straight line, it'll take you 12 hours to get there. If you're off north by one degree, you end up in Austria. If you're off south by one degree, you end up in Tunisia, Africa, right? So one slight small change can bring you to a destination which is very different from where you are intending to go. And it can very easily happen to us in our faith. A degree difference, and we end up somewhere very different from what God intends for you and for me, from where he wants us to land in the reality of the life that he has for us. You know, God's plan for the Colossian Christians is that they would be alive in their faith. And it's the same for you and me. His intention for them, for us, is that we'll be overflowing with grace. That would be abounding in the will of God and in his wisdom and in his power. That would be filled with endurance and patience and joy. His intention for them was to be overflowing with these things, but by degrees, bit by bit, one degree and another, the Colossians were drifting away from this reality. Why? Because they were drifting away from the source of these things. And who is that source? Jesus. You know, if I said to this projector, hey projector, it's okay. That power is not what you need. You know, you need this, you need that, you need more, better environment. And I slowly pull that plug away from the power source. What's going to happen? It's going to be disconnected. No matter what I say to it, you know, the power source is what enables that projector to shine that light, to do what it needs to do. And it's the same of that reality of the life of a Christian, a believer. True life, true abundance, true overflow can only come from maintaining and growing uh, and staying connected to the source who is Jesus. And so there are two things that were making the Corinthian Christians drift away from the beautiful reality of Jesus and him at the core of that. And I'm going to share really briefly what they are. The first thing that was causing them to drift away was a knowledge-centered faith. It's all about what you know. Some people were saying, hey, Colossian Christians, you know, it's not enough to believe in Jesus. You need a special knowledge, a secret knowledge. We will show you that knowledge. And if you have this knowledge, then you'll truly be saved. And this is the challenge, right? When faith starts to center around knowledge and not on the person of Jesus, we start to depend on what we know, not on who he is and what he has done and what he's doing. It's very easy for us to fall into that, that, that trap, right? We start relying on what we know, not relying on who we know. You've heard the phrase, right? It's not what you know, it's who you know. 
Sometimes it can be used in a slightly dodgy way, right? You know, I go to Patty's Markets. I get extra discount because it's who you know. Now, that's not what we're talking about here. But actually, right, the reality behind the truth is that oftentimes in life, it's the relationships you have with people that matter more than necessarily the knowledge or the skill that you have. It's true, isn't it, when it comes to relationships? Now, we might not believe that we need special knowledge, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, our, our faith. But it's very easy for us to fall into a knowledge-centered faith. When it becomes more about what we know, about what we're learning, what we're reading, what we're hearing, more than just walking with Jesus. And you know what? Nothing, uh, uh, well, when, it, when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to knowledge, knowing him and walking with him always trumps knowing about him, hands down. You know, I want to imagine with me for a moment that I, I come to my kids, and someone might put it this way, I come to my kids and I say, hey, Nathaniel, Annalise, how are you going? Let's spend time together. And they say to me, yeah, in a second, Dad, I'm just reading some books about you and listening to some songs about you. You know, I'm thinking about, I might meet up with some other friends and we might talk about you and what you're like. You know, in fact, um, we're thinking of writing some books about you and next year we might get together with some people and run a conference so we can talk about you too. And I'd be like, well, I just want to hang out. (laughs) I just want to be with you right now. You know, again, knowing more about Jesus, you know, it might give us that feeling that somehow our relationship has grown and progressed. And it's kind of like how a fan says to a celebrity, oh, you know, like, I I, I feel so, I know you. They feel closer to them because they know what they had for breakfast because it was on Instagram, right? Yeah, I know you, but they don't really know them, right? Because they know something about them. It can give them that feeling or vice versa. You know, the, the celebrity says to the fans, I love you, but I don't know who you are. You know, like it's, it's a love that's based on some idea or sentiment, not in a reality of a relationship, right? And so uh, what, what we're saying here is, hey, knowledge about someone, it makes a difference only when it impacts our relationship with them. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, it's basic. Of course, it's true. But we forget that when it comes to our faith in Jesus. So, interestingly enough, you can't tell whether someone has been reading about Jesus or listening to a message about Jesus. But you know what's interesting? Oftentimes you can tell when someone's been with Jesus. Hey, you experienced that before? You know, it's like this kind of glow you know, it's like the wedding yesterday. It's like, oh, we're glowing. You know, we, we caught up with uh, Joel and Helen on Friday. Oh, as they came through the door, you guys are still glowing, <laughs> you know? There's a glow that comes when you spend time with Jesus. And so uh, anyway, that's the first thing. The first thing that can distract us from the reality of, of Jesus and our need for him is knowledge center face. The second one that can draw, uh, that drew the Corinthians away, sorry, the Colossians away, was a rules-centered faith. A faith that was all about what you should, what you shouldn't do, what you can, what you can't do, which days you can do it, which days you can't do it. Don't touch this, don't eat that, and don't do this. You know, I heard a story of a pastor who was invited by another pastor friend. And uh, that pastor said, hey, let's go fishing. But let's go at 12.01 a.m. on Monday. Because Sunday the Sabbath. And so this pastor thought, you know what? Uh, Does that mean that all the fish that you catch at 11.59 p.m. is evil and somehow not blessed by God, but every fish that you catch afterwards is? It's like, well, you know, it's too legalistic, right? We can fall into that trap of being legalistic. I know I've gone through that as well. So when faith is focused on what you can and can't do, what you do and you do not do, it becomes performance-based. And many of us know what it is like to grow in a performance-based culture, don't we? You know, we we grow up in school. When you do well, you get the gold star and you feel great. You know, check out my gold star. You know, you get that acknowledgement in class, you know, stand up, you've you've topped the test. And when you're naughty, what happens? 
Now I remember, I think I was in year three. You know, the teacher just put on the, the, white, the blackboard a little circle. Okay, Andrew, just put your nose in the circle. <laughs> just uh, utilizing the power of shame, <laughs> right? And so that happens, you know, the gold stars are different when you grow up. The shaming is different as well. But it's the same thing, isn't it? You know, that performance-based culture that we live in, where we feel great when we're going well, when we're affirmed. We feel terrible when we feel like we're doing badly. And that can happen with our faith. We feel good when we've done our Bible reading for the day or when we've said our prayers. Oh, look at me, I've gone so well. And when we've struggled with sin or something bad has happened or we lost it, you know, with a friend or we yelled at our children or whatever it is. Oh man, I'm such a bad Christian. Oh, can you see how this kind of faith draws us away from Jesus? Because the center of it isn't him and what he's done and what he continues to do and the reality of him living in us. The center of it becomes my performance. Whether I've done well, whether I've done badly. You know, whether I'm succeeding, whether I'm failing. It focuses more on our efforts, more than on the cross of Jesus and the empty tomb and the reality of the Spirit. You know, in early church history, it didn't take long for Christian monks to do some very strange things because they thought that it pleased God. I'm going to share a few with, with you right now, right? You check this out. Some of them chained themselves to rocks. Imagine that. Instead of singing, shout to the Lord, you, you know, Jesus, you know, I'm just chaining myself to a rock right now because I, I believe it somehow honors you and you're pleased by that. Check this out. Some of them would eat just grass. Some of you are thinking, no, it's okay. I know friends that have a salad diet, you know. I just eat grass because they thought it would honor, honor God. Some of them lived in the wild like a beast for decades, thinking it would somehow honor him because they were suffering. I mean, oh, man. You know, the, these things, they genuinely thought it was going to make God happy. And in verse 23 of uh, the chapter that we were looking at just now, same thing. These rules that we put in place, they give us the feeling that we're wise and that we're holy, but they don't help us in either of those categories. So anyway, knowledge-centered faith, rules-based faith, these two things can rob us of our fullness in Jesus Christ. So can I encourage us, if we lean towards any of these things, and I want to say it out right now, I've fallen, into the, I've fallen into the trap of these two things. Anyone fallen into the trap of these two things before? Yep. And if you are still in that trap right now, resist it. Please run away from it, because it will rob you from the fullness that is Christ in you and in me. It will make our faith feel like a eating wheat bix dry on a sunny morning right without anything to drink it down with faith is not meant to be like this only a christ-centered faith can lead to life and abundance amen only a christ-centered faith so that's why paul says live your lives in christ and this is what he means by that i'm just going to share two two things about what it means to live our life in christ the first thing is to be rooted in jesus okay I'm not much of a gardener, and uh, my mother-in-law will testify to that. Now, according to Bonnie's plants, roots provide the anchor needed to keep a plant in place, right? So when the wind or the rain or the storm comes, roots help to ground that plant to withstand that pressure. But more importantly, am I right so far? Yeah. Okay, yep, she says yes. <laughs> more importantly, according to Bonnie, Roots are the lifeline of the plant. They take up the air, the water, the nutrients from the soil and move them up into the leaves where they can interact with the sunlight and produce sugars, flavors, energy for the plant. That's how things grow, right? Now, imagine with me if I've got a pot plant in my hand right now. What, what's going to happen if I just kind of grab that pot plant and just slowly start pulling the roots away from the soil. What's going to happen? 
Sometimes you can't get the pot out because the roots have got stuck. That's right. But if I just start pulling that plant, those, th- 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 those roots out of that soil, man, that plant does not have much of a chance. I know some of you are thinking, but I do know some plants that have the possibility. But you hear what I'm saying, right? In a similar kind of way, to live in Christ, to walk in Christ, what you and I need to do with Jesus is we need to do what the roots do to the soil. We need to draw from him all of the wisdom, all of the joy, all of the power and the strength and the peace and the fullness. We need to draw from him all of these things, this life and this overflow of his love and affection into our lives. And allow that to interact with our world to produce the fruit of the Spirit in you and me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness to overflow us. We need to draw from Jesus as the soil that that would grow in us. And here's the beautiful thing. God has done all of the hard part already. He's gone through the cross And he was raised to life. He left that empty tomb. He's filled you and I with the Holy Spirit. Who's a believer in Jesus today? Give me a big wave. You're a believer in Jesus today. In you dwells the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. He lives in me. He's done the hard part already. All you and I need to do is to keep being planted in him as a daily decision on a regular basis, to make that decision, I'm going to keep abiding in you, Jesus, as you abide in me. So I want to encourage us, make that decision through prayer and loving obedience to keep abiding in him, to keep planting in him, keeping rooted in him, to keep drawing from the lifeline of the indwelling presence, which is Christ in you and in me, the hope of glory. Wow. You know, when Hurricane, oh, no, I don't have the pictures. But when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, out of 700 oak trees in New Orleans, only four were destroyed. I don't know about you, but I find that amazing, right? You know, we cars, you know, destroyed homes, destroyed buildings, destroyed... 700 oak trees, only four of them were destroyed. That is remarkable because of the way in which these oak trees were rooted into the soil, rooted into the ground. There was a, another aspect to it as well, and, and that aspect is, you know, when the oak trees were moving side to side, there were other oak trees next to them too. Isn't that cool, hey? What a beautiful image of the church, yeah? You know, so the rootedness, rootedness in the ground and that hey i got you buddy <laughs> right when the wind was blowing one blowing another i got you too we're okay we got one another that is a beautiful that beautiful encouragement for us be rooted in christ we stand the storm and let's back each other up as we do that now the second thing about what it means to live in christ be built up in jesus and this is something that we are to keep on doing as a regular basis in our life you know, a strong foundation, any engineers here, any people that are involved with construction or that kind of thing? No? Oh, wow, that's fascinating. I thought at least we'd have a few. Oh, yes, there are some. Thank you, Camille. Now, a strong foundation is really important, okay? Because it supports the entire load of the building that's going to go on top of it. And sometimes you can see when you go past building sites, you know, they spend a lot of time digging up, excavating, laying down the foundation because that thing's going to be critical in order for what sits on top of it to continue to stand and withstand the storms and the winds and the pressure that might come. And also to prevent the moisture from getting into that house to weaken the foundation. That foundation is absolutely critical. No one wants to live in a house with a bad foundation, right? Because anything could happen anytime. And Jesus talked about that, didn't he? It's the same with our faith. A faith centered on anything other than an authentic relationship with Jesus, it's not going to stand, it's not going to grow. But when it is, oh man, that's going to come alive. That's going to flourish. 
that's going to abound in fruit. It's going to withstand the storms and the challenges and the floods that come, the earthquakes of life. You know, uh, this is a, a Kamaboko family, uh, sorry, a Kamaboko factory built in 1982. And uh, those of you who enjoy ramen, I like a good ramen. You know, sometimes you see that little thing that looks like, like a fish cakey kind of thing. Yeah, that's what this, this uh, factory makes, you know, kamoboko. Right, so next time you have ramen, just remember this analogy. So it was built in 1982 in uh, Miyagi Prefecture. Now, the fascinating thing about this is during the 2011 uh, Japanese tsunami, 120,000 buildings were swept away, destroyed. Sorry, 120,000 buildings destroyed, 78,000 buildings swept away. But this one stood firm. How? Right? It's a fish cake factory, right? And the beautiful thing about this, even the people that, that were hiding in it managed to survive because of how strong this building was. And you know, I think that's a beautiful image, right, of what you and I can be. We can be this building that is able to withstand the pressure and the storms, even if the hundreds and thousands on our left and our right are swept away, we can stand. And in fact, because of who we are in Christ, we can also be a place in which others can find that safety as well. In the kingdom of God, be built up in Jesus. He is the foundation from which we can grow and the means through which we can grow. Amen? Just like the tree rooted in the soil, drawing everything, it needs to grow and be strengthened. Through Jesus, we draw from Him the life, the wisdom, the guidance, the power, the strength to keep on loving Him, loving others, and build that foundation, build upon that foundation, which is Christ. So I want to encourage us. Go to the Scripture. Go to the Word of God. See all the promises that are in this. Every single thing we could possibly go through or that this world would ever face, we see a promise in the Word of God. Our past, our present, our future, all of the beautiful promises are in here. Go to the Scriptures. See all the descriptions about who Jesus is and what He wants to do in your life and in my life. And then I want to encourage us with prayer, loving obedience, access those promises that they might become alive in our lives, alive in the people around us, alive in our situations, even the situations that seem dark. You know, it's not quite the same. But you know, when you go to a restaurant or a cafe, or when you're shopping online, you pick up the menu, right? And that menu, it tells you everything that is available to you. It's like a catalog. It tells you all these, all these things are available to you. You can take that menu. You can do the word studies on the menu. You can do research on the ingredients, on the things that are inside each of those dishes. And even, you know, all that kind of, you can do that. But, you know, that, that, that thing, that dish that's on the menu will only become a reality when you say, you know what, I'm going to have the wonton noodles with the barbecue pork. And do you, can you add some kamaboko to that? I know it's not, you know, but that would be awesome. And then you pay for it, right? When you order and pay for that, that becomes yours. And you get to enjoy that ramen. I think I'm going to have ramen today for lunch. <laughs> now, it's possible to read the scriptures. It's possible to read the word of God and... It's like going into that restaurant and going, oh, that's awesome. And then you leave. And the waiter's like, hey, wait a second, what are you doing? You know? Like, we do that sometimes with the Word of God. We, we do spiritual window shopping. Oh, that's so good. I wish it were true. Right? Oh, wow, this is amazing. Oh, but, you know, what's happening in my, my friend's life? Oh, you know, let's not do that. Let's not do that. We, we don't, unless, of course, we don't like what's on the menu. Right? That's a different menu, right? But let's not do that with the scriptures and the reality of, of the promises of God. Let's, let's, you know what? Jesus has already paid for it. 
Do you know what I'm saying, right? It would be such a shame if we look at the promises and we see it and we don't bring that into reality with prayer and just that faith, that, that acts of faith. Say, Jesus, this is what you say. Yahweh, this is what you say. And I believe it. I want to pray it into my life. I want to pray it into my friend's situation. I want to pray it into my colleague who's struggling with depression. I want to pray it for my friend who's, who's struggling with sickness right now. He's already paid the price. These promises are available for you and for me. They are the avenue through which we are able to see the supernatural hand and favor of God become a reality in our life, become a reality in our world. That's why that lame man in Thailand is lame no more. Long Pong, that's his name. I love Thai names. But that is why Long Pong is lame no more. And that's why he is now saved. Because the promises of God became his reality. How did that happen? Is it because there was a visiting preacher from the US? You know? Is, is it because there was some you know, person that moves in the prophetic from Malaysia who came and visited? Oh man, it's just ordinary believers. Ordinary believers filled with an extraordinary God. Taking a step of faith. Oh man, how good is God? So my encouragement to us, see the promises of God in Christ. Read that truth and ask him to make it our reality in the broken and dark situations that we see around us, in our schools, in our classrooms, right? You know, in, in our neighborhoods, in, in the situations around us that are dark, we can pray and, and seek the Lord and let's seek that guidance and bring it from the pray, pages of the Scripture to become the pages of our life by the power of the Holy Spirit. For your sake, for the sake of the people around you, for the sake of those who don't yet know Jesus. And you know what? It's not going to come through some special knowledge. It's not going to come because you followed this rule and didn't follow that rule. It's going to come because of who? It's going to come because of Jesus. And, and this is the most exciting thing in my heart. I can't tell if you can tell whether I'm excited or not, but I'm excited. This is the most glorious truth in this passage, and it's in verse 9 and verse 10. And in verse 9, it says that in Jesus dwells the fullness of God in bodily form. Okay, many of us have heard that verse. Okay, yeah, of course. It's the iconic scripture, you know, that, that talks about how in Jesus is, you know, the fullness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, that, that's amazing in itself, right? But look at what it says in verse 10. It says, you, you, you believer in Jesus, you have been brought to that fullness. In the, the fullness of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is in Jesus in bodily form. And then you have been brought to that fullness. He has filled you with that fullness. Through that relationship with Jesus, the fullness is yours and mine. To live in that reality and experience. That is why we can be confident in this. And you know, Bible experts uh, they say that this is what the verse means. Okay, so I'm just going to rattle through a few of these. Believers in him are made full. They share in his fullness. This is what John Calvin said You know, uh, in the modern English. In him are all the resources from which we may be filled so that we lack nothing. Oh, come on. I love that, hey? I want to say that again. Yeah? In him are all the resources from which we may be filled so that we lack nothing. Nothing. Every spiritual need can be met in Christ. When we have him, we have all. I'm just quoting different Bible scholars here. We have been given fullness in Christ. God intends to flood the lives of women and men and ultimately all creation with his love, power, and richness. He has begun this by the infilling of his spirit. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. And he's finally taken responsibility <laughs> and gotten tissues for himself. Thank you, Jesus. 
Now, where was I? Yes. So, so this is what we have in, in Christ. Like, oh, wow, right, you know? Uh, it, it's not just, uh, we, we, sometimes we feel as if we're asking God for a breakthrough and he's really far away. You know, we're calling out to a God who is really far away. We are calling out to a God in whom is the fullness of God and he has made his home in you and in me, believer in Jesus. Wow. I love this quote. Christ is all, and we know that from Colossians. He's the source of all creation. He's the the purpose for all creation. He's the sustainer of all creation. He is all. And guess what? He's all you and I need. How good is God? The one in whom all the fullness of God dwells, dwells in you and in me. He longs that we might experience the fullness of the love of Jesus, that we might be made complete with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. That's Ephesians 3.19. The fullness of God is not a well that you and I need to make a trip, you know, many kilometers to, to, to come to this well and we have one small bo- bucket and we fill that bucket and that's just going to be enough for my week and I'm going to make it because I've got a bucket for my week. No. He has availed his fullness and made his home in us. In you dwells the fountain of life, the fountain of living water. In, in you, do you know him today? Open your heart to him. You know, uh, let the overflow of his limitless life, living water, nurture, nourish, spill over, flood like a tsunami of goodness our friendships, our families, our, our, our people, that, uh, people around us that don't yet know Jesus. Let it flood into our workplaces, our classrooms, you know, the, the sports that we do on Saturdays. Let, let it just flow into that. With Jesus, you are empowered to be a vibrant and alive disciple of Jesus. Why? Because his fullness is available for you and in you. You have more than enough. With Jesus, you're empowered to make disciples of Jesus. Why? Because his fullness is available in you. And he lives in you. And just as the fullness of God dwells in Jesus, he dwells in you and me. So draw near to him. Be rooted in him. Keep being built up in him. Keep centering on him. And drawing from the fullness of God as he lives in you and me. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join us now. And, you know, uh, Tina, all the songs that you guys have sung today are just perfect. So, you know, I, I'm just wondering whether maybe uh, uh, the, your face is all I seek, that one. Yeah. Maybe to gently, uh, gently sing that. Yep. Okay. This is the soul training for this week, church. It's very simple. And if you want to take a photo of it, you know, you can. But uh, if you want to commit it to memory, you can as well. Uh, This is a very simple way of praying that we've taught our kids in kids' ministry in the past, uh, here and also in the city, because you just remember what to pray for throughout the week. So what I want to encourage us to do is to pray out of that reality that Christ lives in you and in me with that confidence, right? So the first thing, you know, Monday, or you can start today if you want, right? First day, pray for the ones that you love, your family members, your friends, you know, people around you that don't yet know Jesus, that you would love for them to know Jesus. And, and pray not as one who is calling out to a God who is kilometers away or, you know, light years away. Call out to the one who has made his home in you and me out of that confidence. Draw from the soil of the promises of God in Christ into these situations. Then on the next day, pray for the ones who teach you or maybe the ones that, that lead you at work. Pray for them. 
you know, guys in Zig JC, pray for your teachers. Pray for your tutors. Pray for them. Pray that, that you know, whatever it is that might be going in their life, that, that Jesus would do a new work in them. Then pray for our governors. We've got a new government now. Pray for Albanese. Pray for our local mayors and, and leaders, our local councillors. Pray the promises of God's word. The scriptures encourage us to pray for them, that we might live in a, uh, a, a, a community where the gospel can continue to be proclaimed. Then pray for the sick. Who are those people? It doesn't matter if they've been struggling with that sickness for decades. You know, if the apostles went by that strategy, the guy that was outside the temple, beautiful, would still have been there. And those that are lame from birth, you know, let's, let's, let's pray. Let's pray into those situations of those who are weak and vulnerable around us out of the richness of the promises of Jesus. And then lastly, pray for yourself. Does that sound good, church? Can we do that? Pray out of that beautiful reality of Jesus, with that confidence of Jesus, not a confidence in whether we know enough, not a confidence about whether we've done enough, but a confidence in He who has done everything, He who continues to move, He who is alive and raising the lame so that they can walk, bringing people from death into life every day. Let's pray out of that confidence. Now, um, why don't we do that now? If you're looking at this hand here, maybe let's seek the Lord and say, Lord, are you directing me to pray for one of these things in particular? He might put on your heart certain individuals or certain situations, but let's invite the Spirit of God right now to prompt us and bring to mind situations that we might pray into, into that situation with a boldness and confidence that comes in Jesus. Holy Spirit, we just ask right now that you would come and, and move among us in a fresh way as we start to pray. We pray, Lord, out of the wellspring of your presence, living in us, that you would nudge us to be praying for different situations. Bring to mind those things that in partnership with us, you would like us to call upon you and uh, see that promise of scripture or see that encouragement for us to pray that so that it doesn't just remain a page on the pages of your scripture, but becomes written in reality into these situations. Show us, God, what these things are so we can pray for them, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Bring those things to Jesus. Pray with faith. Pray in confidence in Him. Lift those things up. Thank you, into these situations we pray breathe your healing into these situations bring your breakthrough God pour out your wisdom oh God Holy Spirit take these promises in your word and bring them into reality we pray every single person that we're praying for every single situation Lord thank you that there is no situation that is beyond your power to step into that is beyond your ability to bring encouragement and bring hope 
and shine your light into. Hallelujah. Just as we're praying, um, I just see an image of someone going to the shelves, kind of like at a Coles or a Woolies, and, and it just looks empty. And there's a sense of anxiety. Am I going to have enough? Am I going to have what I need? And Jesus, we just want to pray, Lord, for anyone among us right now that feels that way. There's a sense of anxiety about whether they're going to have enough, whether they'll have what they need for the future. And we just speak into that. Thank you, Lord, that Heavenly Father, you care about us more than the flowers of the field. You care about us more than the birds, yet you provide for them. So we pray for our brothers and sisters that are wrestling with that anxiety right now, that you would encourage them to know that they are loved and that you will provide because you love them. Thank you, Jesus. I see an image of someone that's sitting alongside someone else. And it looks like it's in a work setting. And they're there to encourage that other person. And that other person is struggling. They're going through some difficulties in their life. And that person in the chair who represents someone here in the congregation is, is there to encourage them and listen to them and speaking words of life into them, speaking encouragement to them, supporting them. And God, we just want to pray for that right now. If that is a vision from you, that everyone in that, that category who's supporting uh, someone at school or maybe a colleague who needs that encouragement, that you would give them the words to say, that you would give them that uh, Holy Spirit empathy, that you would give them visions, prophetic words, so that they would bring a supernatural encouragement into that person's life, that they would bring the living water into that thirsty situation, that would bring the shining light into that dark space in the name of Jesus. stand church and to sing the last song I would like to sing the I want to take the world